The speed of aircraft increased dramatically during World War II. After the war, the quest for speed continued, but was stymied by a sound barrier, an aerodynamic phenomenon that resulted in loss of aircraft and pilots. The wind tunnels at that time could not provide accurate data near Mach 1, the only means available to understand the unknowns facing pilots at transonic and supersonic speeds was to build specialized research aircraft with enough structural strength to withstand the unknown forces. With its ideal flying weather, the Muroc Army Airfield in Southern California was the perfect location for operating these research aircraft. Rogers Dry Lake, with an area of 44 square miles, served as a runway that stretched for miles in any direction. In September of 1946, the first group of engineers from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, arrived at Muroc. They were to assist the Army Air Force in a supersonic flight program involving the XS-1. Their new home was much different than the one they had left in Virginia. The facilities were as rugged as the desert landscape. Initially named NACA Muroc Flight Test Unit, the staff had a single hangar and lean-to offices, while housing consisted of wartime barracks. Some personnel left due to the harsh conditions, but those who stayed established a tradition of innovation and creativity. The Bell XS-1, its fuselage patterned on the lines of a 50 caliber machine gun bullet, was designed to fly at speeds in excess of Mach 1. The Air Force, with NACA support, conducted an accelerated test program with the first X-1, with the goal of quickly reaching Mach 1. The rocket-powered XS-1, later redesignated X-1, was carried aloft by a modified B-29. As the B-29 climbed to altitude, the XS-1 pilot entered the cockpit. On the historic day of October 14, 1947, Captain Charles Chuck Yeager, seated in the XS-1 as it dropped away from the B-29, lit the rocket engines. As the plane accelerated, it pulled away from the P-80 chase plane, trailing a long white contrail. As the speed increased, the Mach meter needle passed 0 0.98, then suddenly jumped off scale, signifying supersonic flight. Captain Yeager had become the first person to break through the sound barrier, piloting the XS-1 to Mach 1.06. NACA flew the second X-1 in a more cautious step-by-step buildup program. Herbert Hoover, not the 31st president, became the first civilian NACA pilot to reach Mach 1 on March 4, 1948. Originally painted orange, the X-1s were repainted white for better tracking visibility against the blue sky. This remains the case even today for most research aircraft. The X-1 program laid the foundation for NACA's and later NASA's flight research. Other aircraft exploring the transonic region of flight included the Douglas D-558 Phase 1 Skystreak and Phase 2 Skyrocket in a joint NACA Navy program. The Phase 1 was a conventional 1940s design with a turbojet engine to explore the transonic regime. Vortex generators, seen now on many military and commercial aircraft, were first developed on the D-558 Phase 1. The D-558 Phase 2, in contrast, was a swept-wing aircraft designed to explore supersonic flight. Though turbojet, turbojet and rocket, and rocket-only versions were built. The rocket-only version of the D-558 Phase II, launched from the B-29, was much more productive gathering supersonic research data. 
Though it was against NACA policy to set speed or altitude records, Scott Crossfield convinced management to attempt an assault on Mach 2 with a D-558 Phase II rocket-powered skyrocket. In preparation for its record flight at the edge of its envelope, the skyrocket was fitted with engine nozzle extensions for more thrust. The skin was waxed to reduce drag and the aircraft chilled to allow more fuel to be carried. On the cold winter morning of November 20, 1953, after the skyrocket dropped from the B-29, Crossfield lit the rockets and climbed to 62,000 feet. Flying a perfect flight plan, he piloted the D-558 Phase II to its maximum speed of Mach 2.005 and became the first man to exceed twice the speed of sound. Versions of the X-1 continued to perform high-speed flight research. The most notable one now sits on a post in front of the main building at Dryden. It is the X-1E. It was modified in-house from the first NACA X-1 to conduct research on very thin wings at high speeds. It first flew in December 1955 and continued Mach 2 flights to the end of 1958. While the rocket-powered aircraft attracted much of the public's attention, these were not the only research vehicles being tested in the 1950s. Some of these revolutionary vehicles looked rather strange, even by today's standards. One such example was the Douglas X-3 Stiletto, which was developed to test very thin, low-aspect ratio wings at high speeds. However, the planned high-thrust jet engines did not materialize. It was severely underpowered with the substitute engines. It was difficult to control and could only reach supersonic speed by putting the aircraft in a deep dive. Although not entirely successful, the X-3 did make significant contributions. Similar wings were used successfully on the F-104. The X-3 was one of the first aircraft to use titanium. Its incredible high landing speed of 260 knots also necessitated the development of high-speed aircraft tires. The Northrop X-4 tested a semi-tailless swept-back wing configuration. Engineers hoped that eliminating the horizontal stabilizers would ease control problems at transonic speeds. But at speeds approaching Mach 1, the aircraft handled poorly. It was likened to driving over a washboard road. This configuration would prove to be impractical until the arrival of digital flight computers 20 years later. The Bell X-5 was designed to test the feasibility of changing the sweep angle of an aircraft's wings in flight. Such a capability would give an aircraft good low speed control with the wings extended, while at high speeds, the wings could be swept back to reduce drag. An extensive flight test program with the X-5 showed these predictions were justified, and the concept has since been used successfully on aircraft like the F-111, F-14, B-1, and others. This first decade of flight research at Muroc was an exciting period with many milestones achieved and signaled the bright future to come. <laughs>